Hey folks, um, I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, I'm going to go over the two readings that I asked you to do on God, and uh, I'm going to start with the uh, non-believers arguments, and we'll move on to the believer. And uh, remember, there will be a quiz on this in the module, as you've probably already seen. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to start off with Ernest Nagel's arg uh, article, Does God Exist? And uh, don't let that fool you, he does not think so. But to be fair, he goes through all the best reasons that theologists, people who study God, have given. Um, so before we get into that article, let me just say a couple things about uh, Nagel's perspective. If you take an English class, you know that when you're doing a reading, you want to figure out where is the author coming from, what is their purpose. And also, let me just mention that um, I'm going to be referring to arguments that I've already gone over in depth in the readings, as well as the lecture videos that exist. So I'm just going to be referring to things like the problem of evil, for example, without fully explaining it. So if you haven't already watched those other videos and done the readings, you need to do that first um, so that you have a reference for the arguments that I refer to here. Uh, and also, the two arguments that will not be on the quiz that appear in the reading, they will come up later in the class, but they will not be on this particular quiz. The first is the ontological argument, so don't worry about that. And don't worry about the moral foundation argument, um, both in Nagel's readings. Uh, finally, uh, Nagel's purpose with this article is to consider whether God exists. It's not to disprove God, that's a misconception. He's looking at the different reasons that have been given, and he rejects them, and he'll tell us why soon. And uh, ultimately, his view is that it's unlikely that there's at least a good God in this universe, and most people who believe in God believe he's a source of morality. Um, so he said, Nagel says, it's very unlikely there's a monotheistic good God based on insufficient evidence and reasons overall. Um, however, he does accept the common counter-argument to God, the problem of evil, uh, as we know, which is, why does God allow evil, more or less, to put it simply. Okay, so Nagel begins his article by um, pointing out that if we're going to discuss God rationally, and to make sure our arguments are as objective as possible, we can't appeal to these three things, which are actually interrelated. And those three things are dogma, authority, and revelation. And what he means by this is that he, he's not denying that, um, let's just take the Bible, because that would be an example of revelation, or the uh, Quran and the Muslim tradition. Um, he's not denying that books like that are valuable. He's not discounting the value of those books to people who read them and live by them. What he's saying is that that's not a sufficient reason to, as evidence that there's a God. And one of the reasons for that is, by the way, if you believe one of those books is the word of God, what you have to consider is that think about a, another tradition you don't believe in. You're not going to accept that book either, right? So for instance, if you're a Muslim and a Christian gives you a book, it gives you the Bible, you're going to say, I, I don't accept that, right? It's the same in relation to you if you believe in the Bible and someone believes something different. So Nagel's not saying these books are bad or wrong. He's just saying it's not good enough evidence because the people who read them already believe it. Right? They, they, so in order to find evidence for God, we have to go beyond cultural traditions. Secondly, he mentions, I mean, it's related to authority and dogma, but all, the, the reason he mentions authority, and this could go both ways, is that if someone says, well, my professor is this great, amazing philosopher, and he's an atheist, so God must not exist, right? that would be appealing to the authority of the professor, just like you might appeal to the authority of the priest. So all of this is stuff we went over at the beginning of the class, which is that to create an argument and be as objective as possible, you want to eliminate those biases and fallacies. And Nagel is just reminding us of that in particular here. So he says, um, we can't discuss God this way in an objective way. So what do we do then? Well, Nagel, fortunately, uh, knows about the many different arguments for God that are out there. So it's not impossible to discuss God rationally, and many theologists do it all the time and have done it for thousands of years. So one of the main arguments that theologists bring forth for why God might exist is often known as the first cause. Um, and this is more or less, there must have been an origin to the cause and effect chain that we see. We're here because of our parents, and our parents are here because of their parents, and so forth. 
there had to be a beginning to it all, according to this argument. Um, now, in the reader and the lecture, and I'm sure you already figured this out yourself, many of you, if not all of you, there's the question of, well, if everything has to have an origin, what about God? Right? What caused God then? And this leads us to this back and forth that you see in the PowerPoint here, which is, well, God is a self-caused being. He doesn't need a cause. But then somebody can say, well, that's a hypothesis. So why couldn't the universe be self-caused also? Right? If we're just going to stipulate that God is self-caused, we could equally stipulate the universe. So that's where there's a butting of heads, which is why a lot of people don't think there's value to going over these arguments. Um, however, uh, many people would argue it's useful to understand your own point of view, to look at the logical limits of the arguments. Uh, however, Nagel adds something new. He says that um, not only does the argument invalid, not only does the argument not make sense, not sound, um, in terms of the content of what caused God, but one of the premises in the argument says that um, there can't be an infinite series of past causes, or it's not intelligible, right? That you couldn't have something go negatively into infinity, it wouldn't make sense according to the argument. And Nagel says, well, wait a minute, why couldn't it make sense? Because math maps onto the real world. That's how we, I mean, an understanding of basic math is how we build buildings and bridges and computers. So if math is a guide to the real world somehow, what about negative infinities and positive infinities in math? So infinities exist in math. Nagel suggests that if that's true, there's no reason to believe that infinities couldn't exist in reality. Right? Mathematicians at high levels will work with negative infinities. Um, so anyways, he uses numbers and integers as an example of why that argument doesn't make sense. So all of this is to say that Nagel says this argument isn't strong enough to show there's a god. First of all, it's a hypothesis. Secondly, some of the logic and the argument doesn't match up. Now, the argument by design uh, relates to the problem of evil, because if the world is filled with evil, too much evil, and that disproves God, it would suggest it's not designed well. So one of Nagel's ultimate rejections of design is that argument, which we'll talk about later, the problem of evil. But recall the argument from design basically says it's so beautiful, somebody must have created it. Right? You look at the banana and you say, look how beautiful it peels back. Or you look at love between two people and you say, how could that have come without a divine source? Uh, and in the reading, Nagel actually references one of the first examples uh, of this argument. Actually, it goes back thousands of years, but one of the most common examples from the 1800s, uh, which is the watchmaker analogy from this guy, William Paley, who actually was a contemporary of Darwin. And anyways, the watchmaker is exactly the idea. The watchmaker is the designer. And the idea is that if you find a watch, it has, even if the watch is broken, one of the questions that might arise is who designed this watch? But why would that question arise? Because it has working parts and it's organized. Um, in the same way, we can look at the universe and say, hey, the universe has natural laws that fit together. We were just talking about math. Um, it has order and purpose, therefore there must have been a designer. If there's a designer of the watch, says the argument by design, there must be the designer to the universe. So that's the argument. Now Nagel rejects this in the same way that Hume does. Recall Hume's rejection is in the reader and I won't go over that. But Nagel basically says it's a bad comparison because the argument is comparing how God, a being that's beyond us, might create something to the way humans who are mortal limited beings might create something. And Nagel says, we can't compare those two types of creation. Now I wanna point out, a, make a point here that some people don't get. Some people see when, when somebody rejects this argument like Nagel, sometimes people say, oh, well, why are you comparing God to humans? You have to remember that Nagel's not comparing God to humans. The argument is, Nagel's responding to the argument that already says human creation is like God creation. So that's not Nagel's fault, right? If you hand me something and I point out that it's broken, it's not my fault that I pointed it out. That's what Nagel's doing. He's saying, you gave me this argument. You said God created us. But then he says, but by the very logic of the argument itself, it doesn't, it, it, the comparison doesn't work. So Nagel's not making the comparison. The theologist, the believer is when they present the argument. So anyways, the, the way he rejects it is he says, um, 
human creation is different even in nature as we observe it now than sorry uh, natural creation in nature as we observe it currently is different than human creation as we observe it currently forget about going back to the beginning of the universe which nobody can do but just look at things as they are now and Nagel points out that the way things are quote unquote created in nature very different than what the argument by design says the argument by design suggests that it, that the creation of nature is like a kid would build a Lego castle, as you can see in the picture, that we create, you know, like the artist creates. But Nagel says, however, nature doesn't create that way, right? We, we know how a child is produced with humans, right? Sex happens and then there's a child nine months later. But that's not creating, you don't build your child like a Legos, like a work of art. Uh, and, you know, when we look at other species, like an ostrich or bird species that lay eggs, it's totally different than the way that the argument by design says we create. So ultimately, Nagel is saying um, they don't fit. They don't fit. If we're going to say that the world was designed like we design, even in our cur even if we look at the current evidence, it doesn't. The analogy breaks down. And if the analogy breaks down and the argument doesn't work, according to Nagel. Now, Nagel mentions another point, because people who make the argument by design often make the claim that they can't believe that the beauty of the universe could have arisen by chance without some sort of higher intervention. And Nagel says, well, you can't believe that, but evolution perfectly explains complexity. Uh, you know, go, going back to the peeling of the banana, there's a reason for that in evolution. There's a survival based reason. Um, co-evolution between plants and animals. And there's a reason for why the, the giraffe has a longer neck. There's a reason even for why we have morality, um, Nagel would argue. So, however, what I think Nagel misses here is that one could uh, argue for theistic evolution here. They could say, Nagel, you're right. Evolution does explain design. However, evolution, and this is true, evolution does not explain the origin. Evolution explains the origin of life on Earth but it doesn't explain the origin of everything. So somebody could say, uh, well, theistic evolution, the idea that God used evolution to create, explains um, not only the design, we, the design that we observe, but it also explains the origin. So anyways, that's a, I'll often do that in these articles. I'll point out what I take to be a weak point in the argument. And that's one where I think Nagel didn't see the point there. Uh, however, Nagel moves on and he gives us a different spin on the argument by design. And I personally like this one better. I think it's more interesting and just my personal opinion. But recall that the last argument by design we looked at, it sometimes is called the evidential argument by design. It looks at the physical beauty around you, the banana peeling, the beautiful sunset, love, and so forth. The butterfly's wings, the symmetry. That's the last argument, version of the argument by design. But Nagel says there's also a mathematical argument by design, which says that you look not at the beauty of the world itself that God may have created that we observe with our eyes, but the beauty of the building blocks of the world, which is math. And, uh, you know, he has a point here. This argument has a point when you look at things like, say, the Fibonacci sequence or these really very elegant, interesting mathematical formulas that underlie our reality. And so what this argument by design says is it says, look at that intricate structure to even, you know, this would even include like the laws of physics and the mathematical equations that uh, drive those laws. There's a beauty to that. There's a sense of order and purpose that suggests um, it was designed by something. So in this case, the designer is more like, say, a, a video game designer. The analogy is more like that, like an independent video game creator. Uh, something like the game, like The Witness, which was basically created by this one dude, Jonathan Blow. Um, it's more like that, like a designer, like God is like a video game designer who's building our code. That's where the beauty lies, not in the evidence around us, but in the code of the universe. But our code would be physical laws and math. So anyways, that's the argument. Nagel's rejection of this is kind of tough to see. Um, if you want to look up the fallacy called begging the question, sometimes called reasoning in the circle, that's basically what Nagel accuses this argument of doing, which is assuming the very thing you need to prove. Uh, and so what Nagel says is that the mere fact that we're here already and that we can even ask the question suggests that order and purpose would has to be here already. That doesn't prove God, that just proves existence. So in other words, as it says in the PowerPoint, 
Order is a condition of us existing to even ask the question. It doesn't mean God's here because there could be order and purpose and God could be there or there could be order and purpose and it could have just been a condition of prior causes, uh, you know, and chance, for example. So for Nagel, the, the assumption of order is already a basic assumption, right? We can't use that to justify something else. You're just, you're just assuming God exists and gave that order when that order is already there to begin with. Okay, so here's an argument that I will go over that we have not covered before. Um, and we kind of touched on it before uh, we had to go online. And when we talked about Buddhism and mystical experiences. Uh, and so the idea behind this argument, it, it basically says there's two ways that it works. First of all, somebody might say, look, I had this really amazing experience. I went in the woods and I, um, you know, went to Mount Everest or whatever. And I had this incredible sense of uh, where I lost my sense of self and I, I became one with the universe. And that shows me that God exists, somebody might say. Or it could be more based on like your ability to self-develop. You know, it could be like, well, I go to church every Sunday and my belief in God helps me to be better. I'm a more moral person. I'm happier. My life's more put together. And then you might conclude from that that God exists. So first of all, I think it's important to note that Nagel is not denying the value of those experiences to the people that have them. Right? To the, as I've talked about in class, um, I've had those kinds of experiences in terms of losing my sense of self. Uh, but what Nagel's saying is he's saying not that those experiences are invaluable to the people. What he's saying is there isn't enough evidence to justify the belief in God for everybody. So if you come out of one of those experiences and you just talk about yourself and you just say that, um, hey, I had a great, this great, amazing experience. It was really valuable for me, but you don't draw any conclusion about God. Nagel doesn't have a problem with that. His problem is when you say, therefore, God exists for everyone because of my personal experience. And right there, I hope you can see the problem. Um, because Nagel would ask, but how do you know what caused it? You, you don't really know what caused the experience. You had a great experience, granted. How do you know it was God? Right? You don't know. And it's not enough. And even if you're very certain on a personal level, that's not enough evidence to conclude that it's God for everyone else, says Nagel. Nagel even brings up the interesting point that um, we don't even know what causes more mundane experiences. So how are we going to know what causes a more profound experience? For instance, we sometimes don't know what caused our stomach ache. Right? You have a stomach ache and it's like, well, was it the fish I ate? Was it a little bad? Or, you know, was it all the pistachios that I had? Did I have an allergic reaction to the peanut butter? Or do I have a stomach bug? Right? You, a lot of times we don't even know the most basic fundamental physical causes where there is a cause, we just don't know it. Uh, and Nagel says, if we can't figure it out in simple cases, how are we gonna figure it out in a case like that? Right? Where, um, how are we gonna figure it out in a profound case? So again, Nagel, going back to the, his purpose with the article, he's not rejecting the experiences, he's just saying it's not enough evidence. And if we're going to talk about God objectively, we need to look at the evidence in his view. Okay, so let's move on to Nagel's ultimate um, rejection of a monotheistic God who's all-powerful, knowing, and loving. Um, the problem of evil. So again, the, the, the one thing, I'm not going to go over the whole argument, but the one thing I do want to point out is that the problem of evil uh, is shows, supposedly, if it's a good argument, which is obviously debatable, if it's a good argument, it shows a logical contradiction in the concept of God, all powerful, knowing, and loving. Um, so it's important to note that, that that concept of God is crucial to the argument. So if you don't think God has those features, all power, and all, all knowing, and all loving, then this argument wouldn't affect you. Nagel, though, believes that most people who believe in God do see it that way. And indeed, in my experience and in the ex most theological writings, especially Christian and Muslim, they do see God as being some sort of an all-powerful moral source, all-knowing source uh, who created us. So anyways, so what Nagel does is he presents the argument 
that, well, it's unlikely there's a good God because of all the evil. But then he deals with two common counter arguments that uh, theologists have given to quote unquote defend God. So this can get logically confusing. I want to kind of be clear about the direction of the arguments. So Nagel presents his argument. Here's why I think God doesn't exist. There's too much evil, problem of evil, right? And then what you see is the counter arguments here on the screen. Those are when the theologist comes back and says, no, Nagel, you're wrong. There still is the possibility of a good God, even if there is evil. So these counter arguments are the counter arguments of believers, theologists. Now, what Nagel's doing is he's dealing with his critics, and then he's showing why those critics are mistaken, right? So there's kind of a three-step process here that's important to understand for it to understand the article. Nagel presents his argument against God, problem of evil. Theologists respond. Nagel responds back as to why those theologists' response are insufficient. Okay. So first counter argument. The first counter argument is that evil's an illusion. Right? The whole problem of evil doesn't make sense because we're not God. We don't know what evil is. We don't know what good is. We're just limited humans. So evil is just an, an illusion. Or another way to say this is that it's merely the absence of the goodness of God. So Nagel's reply to this is that, the way I like to put it is this way. Imagine that somebody's suffering with a, um, a life-threatening disease in the hospital. And imagine you try to offer them comfort by saying, and let's say they're experiencing pain from it every day. Imagine if you were to say to that person, oh, don't worry, what you're experiencing right now isn't really evil or bad, it's just the absence of good. That's not gonna be a comfort because the, the pain still exists for that person. So Nagel is basically saying, you can't just redefine evil as the absence of good. It doesn't help anyone suffering or stop, stop anything. A second point I would point out here, this isn't Nagel, this is my objection to this counter argument, is that if you're going to say God has a source and God is the source of moral goodness, that would suggest that we have some way of understanding his goodness, right? That would suggest like with the Ten Commandments, we can figure out what's right and wrong. But then when the theologist says evil is an illusion, they're denying that, right? Because there's, if you say God is the source of morality, that suggests that morality is an objective thing we can access as humans. But then you, in, in response to the problem of evil, you say it's an illusion, you're suggesting we don't know what morality is. So which is it, right? There seems to be a contradiction there. If God's the moral source and we can know morality, it seems like we'd know what evil is. It wouldn't just be an illusion. So anyways, I wanna be clear, that last objection is one, is an uh, argument I see against that counter argument. That's not Nagel. Nagel's is the one, the redefining terms one on the uh, PowerPoint. Second counter argument. So this counter argument gets its emphasis from this analogy, which is um, sometimes called the orchestra analogy. And it's basically, we talked about this in class, God's plan. It's the idea that God has a plan that we can't see and we can't know. And unfortunately, we're um, right up close in the middle of God's plan, so we can't step back and have a broader view to see that evil might actually serve a purpose or it might have a place in the plan that we don't know. And the way the analogy goes is that it's like, imagine you're watching an orchestra like you see in the picture, but let's say you're way up front, right next to the tuba player, right? just right up next to him or her or them. And all you hear is the tuba. You don't hear the rest of the instruments. You're not really paying attention to the orchestrator, to the um, uh, guy, I forgot the name of the guy, you know who I'm talking about. Um, you just hear the tuba. And so everything else fades out. You're just focused on the tuba. But imagine that you back up into the back of the auditorium and you move away from the tuba player. Now that's gonna fade in to the rest of the sounds. So it fits together with the rest of the instruments. So that means that, um, now let's compare this to God having a plan. We are like the person who's too close to the tuba player. When that, tu when that person is hearing the tuba, that's like us hearing, quote unquote, the evil. We experience the evil directly. We experience the evil in our lives, the pain and suffering. But that's too limited, says this, uh, this hypothesis, says the idea of God's plan. Because if we could step back, we'd see that it makes sense in the same way that the tuba player can step, so that the um, person close to the tuba player can step back and everything makes sense. So that's the argument. 
that if we stepped back and had a God's eye view of the universe, we'd see that evil actually fits in to God's plan. So Nagel's problem here is similar to some of his previous problems. It's a hypothesis. It's just a hypothesis that even if we could step back, which we can't, um, that everything would fit together, that evil would fit in and it would all make sense to us. First of all, Nagel says, you can't assume something that we can't do. Nobody can ever, as a human by definition, have a God's eye view of the universe. It just can't happen. Um, and we're going to say that if we could, it, suddenly everything would make sense. Nagel says, that's a pretty, that's a stretch. And you might remember at the end of his article, he mentions these two phrases. He says, universal pessimism versus universal optimism. This is what he's talking about because universal optimism means good, pessimism means bad, right? So he's saying that even if we could stand back, because nobody can, it's a hypothesis, it could just as well be universal. Everything could be bad. Maybe evil doesn't fit anywhere. Nothing makes sense if we stood back. We don't know that. Maybe it does make sense, like the theologist says, but we have no idea. So for Nagel, looking for something objective here, he says it's not objective, it's just a pure hypothesis about God's plan. We have no idea what God's plan is and where our place in that plan is. So for him, that's not a sufficient reply to um, why we experience evil in the world. Okay, so I think that pretty much wraps up Nagel's argument.